Hi, my name is Sophia and I am a UPF Lumber member and a Lund University student. I'm half Swedish, half American, and we're here to share our experiences from South Sudan. And my name is Luis. I'm also a student here at Lund University. And the reason we want to share our South Sudan story with you is because it was cut short, uh, because there was an attempt to coup d'etat against the president, and we want to share the stories from our perspectives and the politics leading up to that coup. Enjoy! Thank you. Uh, independence started with the peace accords with the North, which were signed in 2005. The peace process and gaining independence took quite a while. As you can see, the official independence wasn't until 2011. Um, and the movement was started by what became known as the Sudanese People's Liberation Movement, which was uh, headed by the army, the SPLA, Sudanese People's Liberation Army. Uh, so upon independence, this army became the National Army of South Sudan, and they were basically handed more guns, uh, new uniforms, to show that they're South Sudanese, and then paychecks, of course. Uh, the leader of this movement is a historic figure in South Sudan known as John Garang. Um, he's really important for the entire movement and he made his way up the ranks. So he is, he acted as the interim president after signing the peace accords with the North. Um, but shortly after that, about two months after these peace accords, while he was acting as president, uh, he mysteriously died in a helicopter crash, which is, uh, has a lot of conspiracies surrounding it. Most people don't believe that it was accidental. Um, mostly because his second in command was uh, Mr. Salakir, the guy with the cover hat in the middle, who uh, became president after uh, John Gray died. And Salakir is also the president today of South Sudan. So he became first the president of the interim government, and then as they got independence, he became the actual president. And then his vice president is Rick Machar, or became Rick Machar at the time, um, the one at the bottom there. Um, we don't know if he was very happy about this, just because these two gentlemen have had a lot of tribal ties between them, like a lot of tensions. Uh, Salvakir is part of the largest tribe, the Dinka tribe, and uh, Rake Machar is part of the Nuer tribe, which is the second largest tribe. So there's always been power struggles between these two tribes, and the fact that there was one pre the president became like from the largest tribe and then the vice president the second largest was a big issue. Um, also, at the time of independence, Juba became the capital. Uh, there's still talks of changing this capital, just because it was not the South Sudanese themselves that chose it. It was actually Sudan, Khartoum, that chose it. So they're not too happy about it, but so far, all the infrastructure is there. Uh, Post-independence, uh, there's a lot of nation-building issues that have arisen, obviously. Um, the largest one is that there's a very strong lack of national identity. Most people associate with their tribes rather than saying they're South Sudanese. So if you would ask someone on the ground, they would say, oh, I'm Dinka, or I'm Nuer. They wouldn't say, I'm South Sudanese. So that's one of the largest issues. Um, also, literacy challenges, as we mentioned, mostly which are tied to the fact that they switched the language, meaning most um, teachers who only know Arabic or only know their tribal language now have to teach in English, a language they don't know. So all the curriculum has also been changed. Uh, they have weak democratic institutions, and on top of it all, they have little to no food production in the country. Everything's imports, mostly from Uganda or from Sudan. Um, but the land is fertile, so they would be able to plant things if they were able to. So most people either rely on buying very expensive produce, which we found most of the time was pretty much at par with Swedish prices, um, or subsistence farming. They can't plant more than and they can make a profit off it to sell, so. And uh, in July last year, um, right before we got there, we got there in September, um, the cameraman, President Salakir, um, he does like his cabinet hats, um, he decided to reshuffle his entire cabinet, meaning he fired his vice president, Rick Machar, and he fired all his ministers. And then what he did, um, this was also in the middle of the night, he decided to do this. It wasn't a planned thing. It shocked everyone in the country. Uh, but what he did afterwards, he uh, hired all his new ministers, were Dinka, which is from his own tribe. So a lot of tension started building at this point, and um, Rick Machar accused him of being you know, biased towards his own tribe. Yeah. Uh, we arrived in September last year. Um, 
welcome to Juba, the capital. It was quite a chaotic first impression. Um, we arrived in a downpour and had to walk into this temporary building that is in place right now as the airport while the permanent airport is being built. Um, and it was pouring rain. As you can see down in the picture, that's pretty much what the roads looked like because it was rainy season. So all our UN vehicles basically just became little floating vessels. Um, and on top of it all, we were carrying loads and loads of cash to last us for the entire semester because they don't have ATMs in South Sudan and there's no bank system. Um, so we basically had to have $100 bills printed after 2006 around our waist and hope that it could last us the rest of the semester. Um, down in this corner you see the South Sudanese pound, which is the official currency, and the face memorial of John Gray, who died in the helicopter crash. Um, and we were also, uh, like, one of our first interactions with South Sudanese was that SPLA soldier, actually. It was uh, quite a shocking first experience. Uh, because of all the rain, I didn't want to put my bag down while we were waiting to get picked up. So there was this metal bench where I put it down, and just a few moments later, two SPLA soldiers came. And one of them put his AK-47 on my bag with a barrel pointing towards me. This is actually the closest I've ever been to an AK before, so it was a little shocking. Um, I just stared at Sophia in panic. Um, didn't say anything because we had read about them. We knew that to like, keep our distance and be respectful, not say anything. So I was just hoping that they would leave before we got picked up. Which they did. Nothing happened. They just smiled politely and uh, they went on their way. Oh, and this is a map of Juba. There's actually no real correct map, but uh, this is the closest thing we have. Uh, there's two UN bases in Juba. One um, that's supposed to be temp uh, permanent, that they're still building, that's on this side. And the blue area over there, um, that's the temporary one, which we live close to. Um, it's called the Tongping area, which we lived. Uh, we lived at the UNESCO office itself. Um, they had a little guest house there yeah. that we could stay at. And it was outside of the UN compound, so we weren't actually inside living. Um, so this is the temporary UN compound. Um, it's called the United Nations Mission in South Sudan. A mission isn't always in place in most countries. It's only in place places where there are peacekeepers. Um, so we would often go here to run and blow off steam. And one time when we were running, we ran into a cow who is named Mr. Ban ki Mu. Um, and he was actually a gift to the UN mission in South Sudan from the UN Secretary General, Ban ki Moon. Um, so it's quite cute. But <laughs> just so you get an idea, these are the temporary housing options for UN workers. Um, so they're just little containers with metal walls, pretty depressing actually. But we found one one day with a Swedish flag, so we took a picture. <laughs> um, working and living in Juba was entertaining and challenging both at the same time. Um, because the office was so new, they were very understaffed, so uh, as interns, we got a lot more responsibility than we ever thought we would. We actually became heads of our own sectors, um, our own departments, basically. Um, I became in charge of the communication information sector, and Sophia became in charge of the science sector, um, which was fun, a lot of work to do. But some of our um, daily challenges was that we didn't have electricity around the clock. Uh, there's no electrical planning or anything in South Sudan, so we had oil run generators. Um, which you have to be careful with using not too much, not too little, because sometimes there would be an oil crisis or the president decided not to distribute oil, which happened to us a couple of times. Hard to work without a fan, but you can do it. Uh, also, plumbing does not exist. Um, we had a truck just like this one uh, come to our house every now and then. No set schedule, just show up. They had some uh, water from the Nile and fill up our tank so we could shower and clean. Uh, one of my biggest frustrations working in Juba was actually as a result of the ministry reshuffle that happened. Um, to contact government officials, they don't usually use email. Some of them did, but most did not. And there's no postal service in South Sudan, so the only way to contact them was through sending letters through UNESCO's personal drivers. So our drivers that were there to drive us to meetings. So basically, we would have to print out letters, have them signed and stamped, and then sent along with the drivers. Well, most of the time, they were pretty incorrect because nobody actually knew the names of the ministries or the names of the ministers themselves after this government reshuffle. The UN was a little confused, it was a little uh, unfair. So, for example, uh, prior to the ministry reshuffle, there was a Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs. Post reshuffle, 
Uh, it became the Ministry of Gender, Child, Social Welfare, Humanitarian Affairs, and Disaster Management. Because they all go so well together. Yes. And if you got this acronym wrong, or if you wrote the wrong name on the letter, or if you didn't have the right minister name, the letter would get sent back. So basically it would take about two weeks to send a letter to any government official. <laughs> First, <laughs> crazy. Um, as it was a post-conflict country when we arrived, uh, we had a lot of daily security precautions to think about. We weren't really allowed to walk anywhere. Of course, we did walk a few blocks here and there, but after sunset, we were definitely not allowed to walk. We were driven everywhere by our wonderful drivers. Um, and then we had a curfew at midnight, meant we had to be in some kind of human compound. Um, also, photography is illegal. Uh, so we apologize about the quality of all of our photos. Most of them are taken via iPhone very sneakily, usually, because if uh, someone catches you with a camera, you can get physically assaulted, shot, or arrested at the spot, just because cameras are seen more as a tool for espionage, like during the five decades of war, um, the only people who had cameras were spies, so if you are walking around with a camera, they will most likely think you're working for a cartoon, the North, um, and they might arrest you. So most of our pictures are usually iPhones, like trying to like pretend we're walking and talking and taking pictures. Um, also, one thing that we had to think about on a daily basis was a uh, flag ceremony. So if you're um, on your way to a meeting or dinner or anything, you have to think about this flag ceremony that was at 6 in the morning and 6 in the evening every day. And the protocol is to stand still. Um, throughout the whole ceremony, you have to stand still. It's led by the SPLA, and if you don't stand still, they might take offense. Um, there was actually like a few years back, a uh, incident with a British woman who was shot in the head because there was some confusion about standing still throughout the whole entire time. Yeah, but we, we were given um, basic training to deal with and prepare for these types of situations. Uh, before we even came to Sassanon, we had to do year training online, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, we had to do both basic and advanced because it was a post-conflict country. And then once we got there, we had to do something called safe training, which is safe and secure approaches in the field environment, which is the picture you see up, up top, that's a simulation we had to do wearing bulletproof vests and helmet. Um, so if we ever wanted to leave Juba and go to the other states of South Sudan, which we had to for work, we had to do this training. And it prepared us pretty well, it prepared us for what to do at checkpoints, um, which were a pretty common occurrence in Juba itself, uh, where SPLA soldiers would stop you and want to search the car or take money or jewelry. Um, and then we also learned about using our HF radios, which the UN issued at each staff member. Um, and then that's how you keep in contact with the security base in Juba. And we also learned how to pack quick run bags, which are something you're supposed to carry with you in post-conflict environments for sure, um, in the office and at home. And basically you have your passport money, basic medicine essentials, um, mosquito repellent flashlight, anything you need in case of an emergency to grab and go. Um, and finally we did the simulation which taught us how to drive in a convoy, which is basically two cars following each other. If we ever were to drive anywhere outside of Juba, we'd have to have two cars with two people each in each car and then contacting each other constantly to make sure that the other car is still, you know, on route. Um, and with this, we had to drive through a simulated landmine field, which is very, very accurate still in Juba today and throughout South Sudan. There's landmines everywhere because of the five decades of war. Um, so we learned that a lot of the signs for landmines are actually um, sometimes just sticks because most of the fields haven't been cleared yet and there's not official markings. So sometimes locals, if they know there's someone who's been injured or killed, by a landmine, they'll just put sticks in an X or put piles of rock. Um, another sign is overturned trucks uh, on the side of the road. This was actually something we saw on an unofficial road trip uh, <laughs> down a bit, one of the only paved roads in South Sudan. Um, so we snapped this picture on the way. And what happened was USA had paved this road and they hadn't cleared the sides of landmines. So basically, this truck swerved a little bit off the road, hit a landmine, and was overturned. So that's another sign that there might be landmines in the area. And uh, we uh, decided one day to climb the mountain in Juba. There's a mountain called Jebel Pujar, Jebel meaning mountain. Um, we took this picture at the top of it. You might have seen it on the poster for this event. Um, yeah, thank you, Pierre. 
Um, so what happened was uh, we actually saw some of these uh, signs. We saw some sticks lying as X's. We saw the stones being in the shape of a pyramid almost. So we knew not to go up those particular paths um, or anything. And we also had a local with us. Uh, nothing happened for us, but a few days later, actually like the day after, we heard that there was three little boys who had stopped on a landmine and they had died. Um, beyond that, the political situation was stable, if you can call it that. We didn't really have any strong warning signs that anything was happening or about to happen. Uh, the only thing we kind of laid a note to was the increased aggression at checkpoints. So, beginning in September, things were fine, but as things neared the holiday season, we noticed that the SPLA soldiers were getting more and more aggressive, as well as the police, at checkpoints, whereas usually they would let you and cars by and just say, okay, pass. Now they would actually stop us and ask for money and search the car. Um, probably pretty quite scary sometimes. But you just comply or whatever. But that was basically the only sign. And we later found out that it had to do with the fact that they hadn't been paid since we arrived. So starting in September, they didn't receive their wages. And then October and November, they didn't receive wages. So as the holidays were nearing, they were getting more and more aggressive asking for money. And then uh, the Sia weekend. Um, might seem a little random to talk about this. But we see this weekend as a turning point of our visit there, just because before this weekend happened, everything was relatively calm, relatively stable, obviously unpredictable. Um, but after this, everything had changed, and it became a new place, a very violent place. Um, but yeah, so this weekend, uh, we celebrated Lucia with the other Scandinavians. We did a little flash mob singing that was highly appreciated and entertaining for people. Um, and then on the Saturday, the SPLM and the police actually had a scheduled protest, just because they hadn't been paid for a long time. They wanted to have a protest in the middle of the city, but it was canceled by the president. We didn't think much of it at the time, but that's basically where it all changed. Um, that night, Sunday night, is when the coup actually started, the attempted coup. Um, we were very, very tired. We had our phones on silence. We went to bed. Monday morning, we woke up to dozens of missed calls and texts from our colleagues and our bosses. Um, some of them read, please have your quick run bags ready with essentials, passport and money, just in case things escalate quickly. Uh, our boss wrote to us, my area is under heavy fire, please keep next to radios. Uh, and then he said, you should pack your leaving country suitcase. And we had no idea what was going on, it was 7 in the morning, Monday. Yeah, it was early, but we still followed orders without really knowing what was going on. We actually sh just shot out of bed, cursed a bit, and started packing our bags. Um, and all of a sudden we heard this loud bang outside our house, followed by lots of gunfire. And we just looked at each other and we knew this, this was a very serious situation. Um, it didn't take us very long to find out what had actually happened. That very night when we were sound asleep, there had been an attempted coup d'etat against the president. So someone had to, like someone tried to take over the government basically. And allegedly it was his former vice president, Rake Machar, the one who was fired in July. Um, so what had happened was, um, yeah, that happened. Um, and then a few hours later, the president took off his cowboy hat, put on his old military suit, which is a very, very strong statement to make, especially as a head of the country. Um, he uh, publicly announced that Rake Machar had tried to take over his government. And what had happened was that it was tribal, very a lot of tribal ties or tensions, just because Rake Machar, from the second largest tribe, the Nuer, he had collected all the soldiers, or almost all the soldiers within the SPLA, who were also Nuer, to go against the Dinka soldiers, who were more loyal to Sabakir. And so the gunfire had actually started within the headquarters of the SPLM in Juba. Uh, for us, the airports were shut down. Uh, we were stuck in the office alone, pretty much. Um, we had made the decision to turn off the power just to save uh, gas in the generators. It was also a very loud generator, as they usually are. Um, so we didn't want to draw attention to ourselves or have lights on at night, especially. Uh, so we had no power and no internet. We were just hanging out in the office alone. And, and at this time also, the president ordered all the phone networks to be shut off because he didn't want any more mobilization of fighters. And at this point in, of the day, we, um, it was also the gunfire was heaviest around our area, just because um, the president 
was hunting Red Machar, and we lived close to, just a few blocks away from one of Red Machar's houses, so they were just in our area, basically. Yeah, so we were crouched down in the corner at night. Yeah, I would say that windows. was the, the scariest part, just because the windows were shaking, and we were alone. I'm glad we were together, though. Yeah. And then, so we didn't have any cell phones or internet. Uh, the only thing we had to rely on was our UN issued radio. And we were getting updates from the UN security base. Um, not very many, mostly it was just static noise. Um, and then once in a while they would come through and say, UN movement restriction, UN workers are not to leave their homes. Um, stay indoors. Stay indoors. Nothing, nothing updating, no, nothing new. Um, and then after a long night of gunfire, the fighting sadly continued the following day. And this time it had escalated a little bit. Because uh, the day before it was just between the Nurer and the Dinka soldiers within the SPLA. But now they had started targeting civilians as well. Just because a lot of civilians are armed, so it's just a matter of time before they joined the fighting as well. And uh, many civilians, especially in the Nuer, they have a lot. They have these like, tribal markings on their forehead, making them a very visible target on the streets. Um, this led to tens of thousands of people just fleeing their homes, um, fleeing to the UN camps, seeking refuge um, because there are armed guards there. Um, one happy story in the midst of the chaos was that there was a lot of pregnant women, and we heard one story from a Swedish soldier that there was a. It was time for one woman to uh, give birth, and he assisted in delivering this baby that they later on uh, named Miss, which stood for the United Nations Mission in Sassana. So it's a nice little positive story in the chaos. Um, yeah, as we mentioned, it was a crazy, hectic night. Um, very little sleep. I think we were both just running on adrenaline, basically. Uh, but we had gotten word on Tuesday that we were probably going to be moved to the UN compound. And this was mostly because our boss was very adamant about getting us out of the office where we were sitting alone. And the fact that we were probably two of the youngest expats in Juba. And we had heard from many of the security people that we were probably the first interns. Um, so they were really, really adamant about getting us out of the office. Um, so later in the afternoon, curfew had been moved to four, so around three o'clock, right before curfew, we were picked up by a five-car armed military convoy. Um, at the very front, sorry, it was a really bad iPhone that was taken out of the window. Taken illegally. Yes. At the very front were SPLA soldiers, um, followed by four cars, one of which we were in, of UN peacekeepers armed in the very corner over there. Um, so we were thinking that we would go straight to the UN compound because it was only a few blocks away from where we lived, but instead they actually drove a route to pick up more UN staff who were living outside, uh, which was really sad and hard for us to see because Juba was completely unlike itself. Um, we had to drive a route through town and there was basically no one on the streets, which is unusual. Usually it's chaotic. There's little motorcycles all over the place and cars and traffic jams. Um, but instead, it was dead empty, and there was just women and children running towards the UN compound, um, and also just militia and tanks driving the streets. So eventually, we picked up some of the people on the routes, and then we got dropped off outside the gate at the UN compound in Tongping. But what they usually do um, when driving to the UN compound is actually drive us inside through the gates. But because there were so many people outside, so many refugees outside trying to get in, they had to drop us off outside. Even though we only had 10 meters from where we got dropped off to where the gate was, it was the hardest 10 meters we ever had to walk, just because there were so many crying women and children asking for help. And we had all of our belongings with us, and we just like looked down and like walking through. It was absolutely horrible. I felt sick to my stomach. Yeah, it was very embarrassing because we felt like these white, privileged UN workers. It was absolutely awful. And then by the time we got to the gate, everyone realized we were going to go into the gate, so everyone started pushing. Uh, Sophia was in front of me, and I just remember them opening the gate. People started flooding in. It was just, I mean, the gate might have been open for a minute, and we let in 20, 30 refugees, one of them armed. Nothing happened. He got disarmed and everything. It just got in my face. It was quite scary. Um, just because there were so many people squeezing. Um, I got stuck for a little bit for a while, and I just hear Sophia's voice screaming, run, 
and um, something snapped in my head, just like, oh shit, I, I got it run. Um, but we make it through, no one got harmed, we didn't get harmed or anything, um, we made it. And uh, yep, the following day, the fighting continues, sadly, um, and at this point we were safe inside the UN compound, but we had no idea what was going on inside, we just heard the gunfire and the tanks being exploded outside, but we had no idea. We were actually at this point a little disappointed with the UN, with the like the news that they were giving us, because they were still just saying movement restriction, don't go outside, anything we couldn't figure out ourselves basically. Um, so the only source of news was rumors, word of mouth, and Twitter. It's not the most reliable of news, but it's what we had, so that's what we went with. Um, the rumors basically said that there were thousands and thousands of armed civilians and military marching towards Juba to join fighting. Don't know if that was true, but we heard it from several sources but it was definitely a sign to get out. Um, also, we heard that the airport had opened a little bit, just for a few hours, but we also knew that the airport won't be open for that long, just because there's no lights on the actual airstrip. So as long as the sun's up, planes can go, but sunset, no planes. Also, commercial flights in Juba are not very common. It would be one flight a day, maybe, to Kenya. Uh, at this point, also, cell phones started working again, but everyone's trying to call their friends, family, colleagues, to see if everyone's okay, so it didn't really work properly. Um, yeah, as for us, as we kind of mentioned, this was quite chaotic. Um, everybody was trying to rebook their flights now that they heard the airports were open. Uh, some organizations had actually decided to try to drive in a convoy down to the border of Uganda, which is four hours south, which was not an option for us. Um, we looked into rebooking our flights, but it wouldn't have been until three or four days later, and it was going to cost about $2,000. And who knows what the situation was like three or four days later. So, I don't know, we were looking for any type of option. I had received an email that morning from the U.S. Embassy saying that they were evacuating U.S. nationals. Um, but of course that meant Louise couldn't come, so I kind of decided to ignore it and didn't tell her about it. Um, but then I had a conversation with my boss who said that he's, he's worked in other field environments um, that have been tough, such as Baghdad, and he said that if the U.S. is evacuating, it's a very, very bad sign and that you need to get out. Um, things aren't going to get better. So I thought about it, and then I ran into an American friend who also, word of mouth, heard a rumor that they were taking non-nationals on the U.S. evac flights. So, but we had to get to the airport in 30 minutes before the last flight was leaving. So Louise and I just kind of ran and grabbed our bags. We didn't say goodbye to anyone. Um, and we just headed for the airport, which was chaos, traffic jams. The SPLA were searching cars to make sure nobody had weapons um, with them into the airport area. And then we arrived to this, which the yellow vests are the US embassy workers who are checking people in. Um, but of course, I had first priority because I was a US citizen. And Louise had to wait in the non-priority line. She's in the pink shirt on the right, over here. Um, so we got split up. Her phone was dead. And as I was going through, I basically told any U.S. worker that if the girl in the pink shirt doesn't make it through, they have to pull my bag off the flight and I'm not coming. So I kind of made a point to point her out, which was quite funny for me because after they told me, I... Uh, that they uh, didn't have it, like, it, they still had enough seats so that we could get on the non nationals. Every US embassy worker that I walked by, they're like, ah, oh, pink shirt, your friend's waiting for you. Or like, oh yeah, your friend really cares about you or something. I, I was wondering, like, how did they know who I am? But she said that she pointed me out, uh, which was nice. And this um, other picture here, that's us walking to uh, our EVAC flight. Quite surreal moment. And this is us being really relieved that we're on the EVAC flight. Um, it was a big contrast going from gunfire, a UN compound, to sitting on an aircraft, having someone ask if we want a Coke or some water, when just a few days earlier we had been running low on food and water alone in the office. Um, and at this point, they also finally told us where we were going. Because of security, they didn't want to tell us where the evac flights were going. And now they finally told us we were going to Nairobi, Kenya which made us really happy because we had some friends from our program here from Lund. One of them is sitting right there today. Um, they were in Kenya doing their internship there. And we had their um, phone numbers and address written up on a piece of paper, which is always good to have when you're traveling. 
And so in the middle of the night, we just showed up at their door because our phones had died, so we didn't have any other option to just grab a cab and, and go, which ended our couple of turbulent days. Uh, one thing we wanted to bring light to was the fact that we don't really find what we experienced that remarkable. Um, we were kind of just caught in the midst of a political situation that we had no control of, and we weren't direct targets in any way. Uh, one of our friends, however, he has a quite remarkable story. Um, this is our colleague Quatch. Uh, and he, on the right. On the right. He worked uh, out of our office for Forrest Whitaker's foundation, who's the actor. Um, and he, when he was little, he's South Sudanese, he was a lost boy, and he decided to leave his village and was picked up by missionaries and actually went to Kenya to get an education. Mostly because he, he told us he knew that that was going to be his only chance to be educated. Um, so he just left his family. He doesn't know exactly how old he is, but probably around the age of eight or nine, he went to Kenya, got educated, and then once the wars ended, he went back to his family in South Sudan. Um, and they were probably very, very happy to see him. But throughout, then he, oh, then he also came back to South Sudan and started working in development and peace, peacemaking for Forrest Whitaker's foundation, um, which is quite remarkable. But during the coup, he was in the middle of Juba, right near the military headquarters, um, in the most heavily gun-fired areas. Um, so he was lying on the floor in his building, we called him a few times. Um, just waiting it out, waiting out the gunfire with a few of his neighbors and their children. And then one, a few hours later, he couldn't stand it. He's like, what's the point? Like, let's just go. So he decided to walk for three hours to get down to the UN compound, um, which was quite risky for him because, as you see, maybe on the picture, he has tribal markings on his forehead because he's a part of the Nuer tribe. Um, but he decided to walk nonetheless with his female neighbors and their infant children. And eventually we met him in the UN compound. And even there, he was still so resilient and wanted to help the refugees and was like running to them with food and water and trying to help the UN organize so that they could have a decent stay while they were there. Um, so we just wanted to bring this to light. We thought his story is so much more remarkable and out of these political situations that happen where nobody has any control, um, these types of stories are nice to hear. Um, as for the situation after we got evacuated, um, the fighting sadly continued. At this point, tens of thousands of people have, um, have already been killed. Um, but the fighting had moved from Juba, where it started, where we were, and it moved more to um, the cities of Bor and Bento. And the reason for these two towns is because they are oil hubs. Um, they're very strategic in terms of a conflict, very lucrative. Um, so it was taken by rebels, um, by rebels I mean the people who are loyal to Rick Machar, who were against the president, um, and then it was taken over by the government and then it was taken back, it's been back and forth a lot. Also um, there's a, now over a million refugees and over 80,000 internally displaced people within South Sudan. Um, all the UN bases around the country have become uh, refugee camps and of course they weren't prepared for all this so it's a very emergency based camp. As you can see here, they don't have a lot of things. It's basically whatever they brought with them. Um, also, there was a peace agreement signed in January, just a few months ago, which was, was a sign of positive, a positive direction. Rick Machar went to, no, uh, Savakir went to Ethiopia and Rick Machar sent a delegate. Because at this point, uh, Rick Machar had been um, publicly labeled as a traitor and an enemy of the state. Unfortunately, this peace agreement was broken within a few hours. Uh, as for today, another peace agreement was just recently signed this month, um, the second peace agreement slash ceasefire. And actually, Machar and Kier met in Ethiopia, and first time face-to-face -face since the fighting began. And both agreed that there would be a ceasefire within 24 hours so that humanitarian aid workers could make their way through to the most um, destructed areas. And then they also agreed to continue have, having meetings so that they could form some form of inner room government or joint government. Of course, this one was also broken within a few hours. The fighting has not stopped. Um, currently, more than half the population is still in need of humanitarian aid because the workers can't get through to the violent areas. Um, 
both John Kerry and Ban Ki-moon have been very involved with this process. Um, John Kerry said that this could potentially become a genocide, which I would almost argue it may have already begun because they're targeting civilians of either New Era or Jinka. Um, there's been a cholera outbreak in Juba for sure, and in the other major cities or villages, they're not quite sure because they can't get in there to survey them. Um, and Ban Ki-moon was warning that there's going to be a catastrophic famine, which I completely agree. Uh, basically, subsistence farmers rely on seed stock from humanitarian organizations, and they haven't been able to get them. And if they don't plant the seeds by the end of this month, when the rainy season begins, um, they'll have no crop. So that's coming. Uh, yesterday there was a donor conference in Oslo. Um, and how much were they asking for? 1.8 billion? Yeah. They asked for, humanitarian and development organizations asked for 1.8 billion dollars from the West um, and from other donor countries, and they received 600 million, I think. Mostly from the US and the state of Norway. Um, but of course, that's not quite enough for what they need. And uh, so there is still conflict going on today. Uh, most of it is around the country and not in Juba anymore. There's no active recorded conflict in Juba. And in July, I'm actually going to go back to work full time. Um, so that will be interesting because I haven't been back since the evacuation. And um, yeah, some book recommendations. Yeah. Uh, this might have been a lot of information to take in with the, in an hour. But if you're interested in this topic, there's a, a few books we recommend you to read. One of them is Emma's War. Um, it's a true story about a British aid worker who came to South Sudan prior to independence, who fell in love with and got married to Rake Machar, the one who started the, the coup against the president. Um, and it's a very interesting read just because it gives a good history of the country, what it was like, and uh, it gives a good backstory on how Rake Machar came to power. Uh, two others are about um, lost boys of Sudan, South Sudan. Um, what is what is pretty dear to me because I actually met the person who it's about, Valentino. He was a lost boy when he was younger, now he's an adult um, working in development. He was actually a refugee in the U.S., but now he's working out of the U.S. and South Sudan is in development, um, peace building for his nation. And the other is They Poured Fire on Us from the Sky, which some of you may have heard of. It actually became a movie, I think not too many years ago. Um, and it's also about three lost boys who were evacuated to the U.S. Um, and one of my favorite scenes from it is when they walk into a grocery store in the U.S. because it's just a bunch of boxes and you can only imagine they've only ever seen fresh produce and goat meat. And then they walk in and there's just like piles of boxes that they don't know what to do with. And they didn't know how to use a freezer so they ended up putting cereal in the freezer. And it's They're both very good reads and give good historic accounts of the fighting that happened prior to independence. And uh, that's it from us. We want to thank you, UPF, uh, for giving us the opportunity to share our story. And thank you guys for coming out and listening to us. We really appreciate it. So if you have any questions or anything, fire away. We're hopefully we can answer them. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.